My name is John Rakisa. I uh, am an organizer with the Northeast Los Angeles Alliance. I also work with other groups. Um, my background is in advertising and design, but also uh, photography. And my last actual paid job was at a newspaper uh, as the photo editor. Um, and one of the things that I started about eight years ago uh, was uh, a workshop or teaching groups the, about uh, documenting your community and your neighborhood. And that was called Cinturistas. That led me to doing more research on communities and gentrification as, as it was unfolding at the time in 2014, 2015. My work experience in advertising is oddly very similar to um, organizing. And one of the things that we do is we try to generate interest and get people working towards a goal in this in, in in the commercial sense, we want people to buy a product, but in the organizing sense, we want people to um, step up and act on, uh, on a concept or an idea or an injustice. Um, we believed that very early on, uh, maybe you know, slightly jaded to, to think that what we were doing in the commercial world was not as important, but the techniques that they use are very applicable, so I spent much, much of my time just doing you know, commercial work, but always on the side, I always had about 30% of my work was pro bono for either nonprofits or causes um, and such like that. Um, so organizing kind of just was an extension of what I was doing in advertising, but I was doing it for a better cause. I get into a lot of arguments with family and everybody about you know the injustices that are going on. Um, and trying to change people's perspective. The reason I believe that it's so difficult is that um, we, we cannot see past our own privilege, so we make choices based on that. And a lot of gentrification is, is kind of like that. Uh, you know what, I, I, I just want to buy a house. I'm not displacing anybody, uh, but, I'm, but they don't realize that they're raising the value of the land and keeping other people out of it uh, when that value raises. Um, Again, it's people's own self-interest that keeps them from understanding uh, the effects of gentrification. We have to get past our own privilege. Uh, everybody has it when it comes to gentrification. Uh, the second issue that I, that I quite forgot to touch on was, uh, was uh, changing the laws, that uh, making more equitable laws. Especially in housing rights, you need to make equitable, more equitable communities. And land use and planning is one of those areas that we're working on now that needs uh, um, uh, more equitable practices. It's a very racist system. And gentrification intersects with a lot of other things. Um, I mentioned homelessness before. 11% uh, of the people that are homeless have faced some sort of uh, housing rights or tenants or tenants rights crisis. The, the homelessness is a really another big issue with uh, a lot of different causes, but we know that uh, through LASA, the Los Angeles Area Homeless Services Authority, that 11% of the homeless folks are there as a result of uh, housing issues and housing inequities. Well, they've evolved. When uh, we first got into it, in 2014, doing the workshops, we were looking at the cultural shifts and the landscape of a community. So this business is gone, that business is gone. Um, and there was just a few of them. Um, in the next phase, we saw, um, uh, uh, especially in Lincoln, I'm not Lincoln, it's in Highland Park, you see the York Corridor was a lot of home flipping going on. That was around 2015, 2016. And the home flipping was interesting because there wasn't a lot of, dis there wasn't a lot of, well, there was displacement, but it was a kind of like a, a, a hidden displacement. So in some cases, some of those houses had guest houses. The people that lived in those guest houses were displaced. We actually came across several um, in our, house, in our, in our um, homeless shelter that had lived in those areas and then lived in those guest houses. And when they sold to somebody new, they got evicted and they didn't have the means to, buy, to find another apartment of equal value. And so they, they became homeless. Um, but that was also a very small amount of capital. This was, you know, individuals, uh, mostly the creative class, 
uh, are, you know, the artists that are coming in from the west side looking for homes and investments. Then the second wave from that was the, uh, I'm going to say wannabes or the lifestyle folks, which they were creative, but they don't create anything. They just act creative. They started renting the available space at that point. Um, and that pushed a lot of people out. Then the next wave that came in was another investment class uh, on Figueroa, which was uh, the multifamily units. Those multifamily units, apartment buildings and such, um, became the subject of not necessarily home flipping, but flipping the properties, investing it, slapping some paint on it, raising the rent, sometimes doubling the rent. And one of the studies we did, we found that within the first six months after a building sells, 50% of the building is empty and then they work the next six months trying to get the other 50% out. Um, what that does, and they'll spend money, they'll, you know, they'll spend all kinds of money on it. If they, the first wave, they'll offer you $3,000 to relocate. $3,000 is nothing. Um, they can, they've gone, uh, I heard of a one guy who we were organizing with in his building. He eventually left three years later. They offered him $75,000 for his apartment. He was an older man. He was very well known in the community. He had a store in the corner. He, when he sold the store, he had um, a pickup truck uh, or a, a van that he sold his fruits and vegetables from. And he sat there all day, and people would come by and talk to him. He was he was no he was name was Don Chico, and uh, everybody knew him. He was part of that community. When he took the seventy five thousand dollars and left the community, he died six months later. That's the other effect, the health effects that happens. When you're, dis when you're severed from your community, there's a lot of trauma that goes with that. There's a uh, professor, uh, Fully Love, out of Chicago that's studying what they call root shock. And root shock essentially talks about how displacement um, aggravates the existing uh, conditions in a home, like alcoholism and, and, and uh, uh, domestic abuse, uh, domestic violence and such. But also what happens is the, uh, when you get cut off from your, your family and your network, you lose all this human contact. And we believe that's what happened to Don Chico. He lost his, his connection because he was, he was practically the mayor of Highland Park. And in six months, he was living someplace else in another community, completely isolated from everybody. Um, so there's this health effect again. Right now, this moment, we uh, are facing land use issues and we're talking in just the northeast Los Angeles area alone there's probably about 30 projects that have devastating consequences in the community and what I mean by land use is new development so I mentioned Avenue 34 I believe that's a uh, 468 unit uh, luxury apartment building and when I say luxury I, I don't I don't, this is, this, is, this is an argument you could have with Gil Slavio. Um, he says it's market rate. Well, the people that we're talking about that are going to get displaced are actually uh, much poorer than he thinks, and they consider that unit luxury, not market rate. They can't even afford market rate, so anything that looks like market rate looks like luxury to them. So we, we uh, label it as a luxury unit. Um, and then there's uh, right there, and then you go up the street from that to Pasadena Avenue and Figueroa, and we're looking at 100 condominiums valued at about $800,000 a piece in a neighborhood of uh, single family homes and apartments, low rent apartments. Uh, you go up the street to Avenue 50 a little bit further, and you have uh, eight apartments, uh, an eight apartment building being uh, evicted so they could build 13 $900,000 homes. Uh, it's something called a small lot, using the small lot ordinance, which means they could put houses three inches apart and you buy that one little plot of land after they've divided the larger piece of land which the eight apartments sit on. Now you go even further a little bit north of that and you go to Avenue 64 uh, and you have uh, a building called, actually it doesn't have a name yet, but it's on Avenue 64 um, and that's being resisted by another group of folks. They want to build 30 co-living units and co-living units is like the new trend now in Los Angeles. Co-living basically means it's, it's almost like a dormitory style. So they want to build 30 units in a historic neighborhood, and it's a three-story kind of cube. Um, and those 30 units will have five bedrooms each, and the landlord will rent out each bedroom individually. Yes. <laughs> um, that particular developer is our favorite, Galena Wasserman, who evicted the 57 families 
from the Marmion Apartments right around the corner from there. Um, you go further north and there's more small lot homes. You go out to Frogtown and you have a building called the Casita Lofts, which is on the Bowtie parcel or near the Bowtie parcel. They want to build 419 units or 417 units, I believe. I'm not sure which number. Uh, and those are, those, those are definitely calling luxury lofts. Uh, what these lofts do, and what these new developments do, is increase the land value. And when the land value is more expensive, that means landlords can charge more rent. That process that we saw in 2014 is the same thing that I'm just talking about. But it was so intense that people weren't protected because the values were jumping so high that even if you weren't a rent controlled building, people were still trying to evict you, legally or illegally. They wanted to get you out because they knew they could double the rent on that apartment. So they're not afraid to pay $75,000 to get somebody out because that will, they can make that back in a matter of a couple of years when they, when they double the rent to $1,800 a month. Um, so what we're calling that is the next wave of gentrification, which is land use and planning and uh, these mega developments. In. And then that leads up to where we're at now, which is I mentioned the uh, USC Biotech Corridor, the LA River Revitalization and CAST, the Cornfield Arroyo Specific Plan. That $12 billion or more of investment is set to raise the land value and, um, and displace, uh, we estimated 103,000 people in, the, in, in that area between El Sereno and Frogtown. Um, in Lincoln Heights, 69% of the, of, of the people there are renters. 30% of them are land, landowners, and the landowners are going to be fine because the value of their land is going to go up. But that 69% of the renters, what happens to them? They can't afford to stay there. Uh, and so that's kind of like the history of how it's unfolded and where we're at today with uh, land use and planning and having to try to control that. have to rise up and say enough is enough you know